Unleavened Bread Ministries presents Panoramic Bible Studies with David Eels. Hello, saints. The Lord bless you. We've been talking about grace to walk in the Word. We've been studying Psalm 119. There's so much encouragement there to get in the good habit of researching God's Word day in and day out. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you, Lord, that you would give us the grace that we need, Lord, to work in us to will and to do of your good pleasure, that we might have such a desire in our heart to seek your Word every day, Lord, and um, put it in our heart that we might not sin against you, that we might walk in the steps of our Lord Jesus, that we might bear the fruit of that word, 30, 60, and 100 fold. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your precious promises. Just give us that desire. Draw us, Lord, and cause us to have that hunger for truth, hunger for your word, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord. Amen. Well, I'm going to take up where we left off in um, Psalm 119 and 97. It says, Oh, how I love thy law. Praise the Lord. Oh, that we would all just love God's word. It's my meditation all the day. That's a gift from God, folks. He can certainly give it to you. You know, meditating is, you know, um, not just a very fast read. It's a slowing down and thinking about what you're saying and uh, thinking about what's being said there, Le giving the Holy Spirit a chance to bring to your remembrance other verses that fit in. You know, actually, you're putting together a puzzle here, you know, uh, a puzzle that works out to be the truth. You know, um, Psalm 119 also says, the sum of thy word is truth, right? So we have to give the Holy Spirit time to put this puzzle together for us. And it takes some meditation. And, you know, the more you do that, I believe the more you will love God's Word. If you slow down and just see what God can show you out of each verse, you know. And 98 says, Thy commandments make me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. Boy, this is a time that we need this. We need to be wiser than our enemies. We're going into a tribulation here and a great tribulation in which our enemies are going to be making war against the saints. The beast is going to make war against the saints. We need the wisdom of God to go through this time, and the Word will give us that wisdom. Thy commandments make me wiser than mine enemies, he says. I have more understanding than all of my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. And this is so true. If you are one of those that has the gift to really research the Word and love the Word and look for the truth and have the basic principles of, of finding truth in your heart, you will outgrow your teachers. You know, I, I had mentors when I came to the Lord and um, they gave me a start. But I can look back at some of those people, and they're right where I left them. <laughs> because they had, you know, basically made up their mind, um, set their doctrines in concrete, and um, they're right there, right there where I left them. They didn't continue to grow in the wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men, as the Scriptures teach about Jesus, you know. Even Jesus grew that way, you know. Love the truth. Ask God to give you a love for the truth and meditate on His testimonies. I understand more than the aged because I have kept thy precepts. Well, I tell you what, if you are a hearer of the Word and a doer of the Word, you will understand a lot. You'll have a lot more understanding because God gives light when you walk in the light that He gives you. And if you're not going to do that, there's not much use in God giving you light 
which you would be condemned for not walking in, right? So God's very merciful in that way. You, um, you, can, you can gain more understanding than people who have been in the Lord much longer than you because they're sidetracked, you know, they're caught in a, in a trap. And um, God is, you know, I, in Job, we see an example of this exact thing. You know, um, Elihu, let me read that to you, Job 32. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Job had a little bit of a problem here, you know. And um, he had self-righteousness hidden in him that God was trying to reveal, right? Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite of the family of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled because he justified himself rather than God. And also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Elihu had waited to speak unto Job because they were elder than he. And when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, his wrath was kindled. And Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite, answered and said, I am young, and ye are very old. Wherefore I held back, and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, Days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man, and the breath of the Almighty giveth them understanding. So it's not just how long you've had a mind and known what the Scriptures said. The Holy Spirit can breathe that understanding into you. There is a spirit in man, and the breath, or the spirit, same word, of the Almighty giveth them understanding. God will reveal things to people, as, especially as we just read, people who will walk in the things that he gives them. They will walk in the things he's given them. He'll give them more. It's not just a mind thing. There are scholars that have studied all of their life, and um, they know nothing of God. That's a sad thing. And they may have been with the Lord for a long time. It is not the great that are wise, nor the aged that understand justice. Therefore, I said, hearken unto me, I also will show mine opinion. Behold, I waited for your words, I listened to your reasonings, whilst you searched out what to say. Yea, I, attend, I attended unto you, and behold, there was none that convinced Job, or that answered his words among you. And as you know, the Lord um, rebuked the three elder men, but he never said anything negative about Elihu. He evidently spoke the truth unto Job. He was the fourth man that many people don't mention, but he spoke the truth. Even though he was younger and he preferred their age, he permitted them to speak. He was respectful of their age. Their age didn't show forth the wisdom that he, show, he showed forth in, in the book of Job. So um, if you are one of those that meditate in God's Word day and night, I can tell you, it'll be just exactly like he says here in verse 100. You'll understand more than the aged, because you're not only a hearer, but you're a doer of the word. He kept the precepts. And 101 says, I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might observe thy word, or keep thy word. You know, there's so much doctrine out there that basically permits you not to even believe that you have a need to keep his word. That's works. Salvation by works, they call it. But obviously that's crazy. That is a, a crazy doctrine that keeps people from growing up in the Lord. The word is not really important with some of these doctrines out there. It's really not important since you're uh, unconditionally secure and you're going to be saved no matter what, or you're uh, ultimately reconciled unto God or whatever. These crazy doctrines, um, ear-tickling doctrines of men make the word unimportant. 
You know, if these doctrines are true, you don't need to study God's Word. It doesn't make any difference. That's why you know these doctrines are the devil. He said, I have not turned aside from thine ordinances, for thou hast taught me. Yes, we need a teacher. You have no need that any man should teach you, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. And so, we need to be taught of the Lord. Ask the Lord to be your teacher, and He will do that. You know, everyone has a right to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, and that, that means that He is your teacher, right? And modern-day men, you know, have not studied the Word of God. They've gone to their Bible colleges, and they're just cookie-cutter, you know, teachers. They've been cut out, stamped, everything is proper, but they don't have the knowledge. Ask the Lord to lead you, though. Ask the Lord to guide you, the, the breath of the Lord to give you wisdom, and He will certainly do it. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Well, you remember the story of John in the book of Revelation, how the angel gave him the little book, and how that that little book, which we rep probably represents the book of Revelation, was uh, sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his belly. Actually, all of the book is that way. It's sweet in our mouth. It's nice to understand these things about God, but it also demands obedience. It demands the crucified life. And uh, as you know, the apostle warned them about their God being their belly. So if it's bitter in the belly, people don't want to to humble themselves to it. They don't want to study it. They feel more comfortable doing other things, you know. Anything that's contrary to their God, which is their belly, their flesh, well, they, they don't want to hear it. But to some who embrace the cross of Christ and they embrace the crucified life because they know it's life, they know it's eternal life, they know it's fruit, you know, you can't gain your life unless you lose your life. There's no way you can bear fruit without dying. You know, as the inner man is being renewed, the outer man is decaying, the Bible tells us. You know, they, the old man has to die in order to give place to the new man, just like when they went into the promised land and put to death the, the carnal man who lived in the land, you know, and they took their place and lived in their houses, raised their crops, raised up their own fruit, so on and so forth. So it's, um, Bitter to the belly, it should be, but it is exciting to find out about God, so much so that you're, you're uh, comforted, you know, to, in the crucified walk, right? Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Yes, amen. We, um, you know, I, I like especially Hosea chapter 4. I'll read to you um, verse 5. And thou shalt stumble in the day, and the prophet also shall stumble with thee in the night, and I will destroy thy mother. Probably talking about Babylon here. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I also will reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I also will forget thy children. So many people only want whatever the preacher gives them. They don't want to go look and search out their own salvation with fear and trembling. They, want, they like a simple gospel. But those that love the Lord, they, they want to get into the deeper and deeper things, you know. They want a deeper relationship with God. They want to grow up. Some people don't see or feel any need to be like Jesus, right? Verse 7, As they were multiplied, so they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people, set their heart on their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways, and will requite them for their doings. And they shall eat and not have enough. They shall play the harlot and shall not increase, because they have left off taking heed to the Lord. 
whoredom and wine and new wine taketh away the understanding. My people ask counsel at their stock, and their staff declareth unto them, for the spirit of whoredom hath caused them to err, and they have played the harlot, departing from under their God. And this is where I think the majority of the church is. But God's word uh, will make us a disciple of Jesus Christ. It will, he said, through thy precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. God will convict us through his word. He'll give us a, a, a hunger for his word. He'll give us his grace. 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And as I've said many times, the word shows us where we stand and it shows us where to go. But we should keep on walking in the light because that's where the promise is. You know, 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. If we walk in the light, we can't stand in the light. It's a lamp unto our feet, but it's a light unto our path. He wants you to go, to walk in the light. In other words, more and more light, new light every day, you know. Don't stand where you did 40 years ago, like some people are doing, with no more knowledge of the Word, no more understanding of the truth, no more meditation of God's Word. If you reject knowledge, he said, he will reject you from being a priest unto him. We have to desire knowledge. We have to seek it like choice silver, the Bible says. I have sworn and have confirmed it that I will keep thy righteous ordinances. Amen. You know, we can say this by faith. We can say that what the Lord Jesus gave us is his gift of obedience to the word because everything in the reconciliation has been given unto us. We can say with bold faith in him that I will keep his righteous ordinances. I am afflicted very much. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. Listen, this is the gift of God. God can do this for us. Quicken me, meaning make me alive, O Lord, according to thy word. In other words, I want exactly what your word promises me, life, right? 107, uh, 19, it says, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saveth them out of all their distresses. He sendeth his word, and he healeth them, and delivereth them from their destructions. Now, if the method that God uses to deliver us from our trouble and uh, to heal us um, is God's Word, and we're not paying attention to God's Word or putting it first in our life, we're going to miss out on something extremely important here. His method is, he said he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. It is God's word that we need to be paying most attention to. He said, quicken me, O Lord, according to thy word. Make me alive according to your word. Life comes from God's word, as Paul told Timothy. He told us what eternal life was. It is to walk in God's holiness in obedience to his word. Back in 108 and 119, it says, Except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thine ordinances. You know, he didn't say just show me thine ordinances. He said, teach me thy ordinances. You know, this can sometimes be painful, but it's necessary. We need to be taught. You know, if you you train a, a dog, for instance. You, you teach that dog to do something, to obey, to do tricks, to be obedient, so on and so forth. You can show the dog what you want. That's not enough. Some people can read the Word. It's not enough. But if you ask the Lord to teach you or to train you His ordinances, which is what we desperately need, then He can do that. Again, it's by grace. 
He's our teacher. You know, we are his disciple, right? We, each one of us are actually disciples of Christ, right? And he is training us in the way. And uh, yes, men can be useful in this as long as they speak the word of the Lord, and uh, especially under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But we don't have a need for any man to teach us, the Bible says. We have an anointing from the Holy One. We are, we are to be the disciples of Jesus Christ, not of man. My soul is continually in my hand, yet do I not forget thy law. Amen. If your soul is in your hand, do not forget God's word, because that's how he heals, that's how he delivers, that's how he saves, that's how he causes us to bear fruit. We are the fruit of God's word. And without bearing fruit, Jesus said, 36 to your hundredfold, we are not going to enter his kingdom. The wicked have laid a snare for me. Yes, amen. Yet have I not gone astray from thy precepts. You know what? When the wicked are persecuting you, tempting you, so on and so forth, that's when you're most likely to go back to your old ways in defending yourself or saving yourself from them. That's when you're most likely to go astray. And uh, I'm going to read to you 1 Chronicles 14, uh, verse 10. And David inquired of God, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto him, Go up, for I will deliver them into thy hand. See, he did, David waited upon the Lord. He uh, wanted the direction of God in his warfare. Um, the Israelites did this quite often, you know, with the Urim and Thummim. They waited upon the Lord, and he gave them instructions and direction. Obviously, when we're going against an enemy, many times an enemy who is greater than us, larger than us, we need the direction of the Lord. So they came uh, up to Baal Perazim, and Dave and David um, smote them there, and David said, God hath broken mine enemies by my hand, like the breach of waters. Of course, you can't say that unless you're following the Lord, right? He just, he just wants to use us, but we need his direction. He is the head. We're not the head. When we're fighting against an, an enemy like we're about to fight against in the tribulation period and in the spirit, we need the Lord to be our head. We need his word to guide us. Therefore, they call the name of that place Baal Perazim. And they left their gods there, and David gave commandment, and they burned them with fire. And the Philistines yet again made a raid in the valley, and David inquired again of God. And God said unto him, Thou shalt not go up after them, turn away from them. In other words, he, notice he doesn't do everything according to our minds. He doesn't give us a law to follow. You know, when you're coming against the enemy, he wants you to be guided by him all, at all times, especially when you make warfare. Thou shalt not go up after them, turn away from them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And it shall be, when thou hearest the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt go out to battle, for God is gone out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did as God commanded him, and they smote the host of the Philistines from Gibeon even unto Gezer. And the fame of David went out unto all lands, and the Lord brought the fear of him upon all nations. Why? Because, why did he find such success? Because he was being guided by the Lord. And this was a big difference between him and his predecessor in uh, 1 Samuel 13. In fact, I'll read that to you in verse 8. And he, that is Saul, tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And, you know, Paul was being, excuse me, Saul was being moved by fear here instead of by the Spirit of the Lord. He'd already been given instructions by the Spirit of the Lord 
through Samuel, and he was disobeying them because of what he was seeing with his eyes and because of the fear that was coming upon him. Saul said, Bring hither the burnt offering to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offerings, behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. Samuel said, What hast thou done? Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines assembled themselves together at Michmash, Therefore, said I, now will the Philistines come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not entreated the favor of the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, for thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath appointed him to be prince over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So, you know, not following the Lord, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. We're not going to get the reward of a son of God. We're not going to be a ruler in God's kingdom unless we learn to follow the Holy Spirit. We can't be a leader unless we learn to follow. And um, because there's this, there really is only one leader, right? And we understand and know that that is the Lord God. I like the next verse in Psalm 119. It's 111. You know what 111, the gematria one that comes out to 111 is the Lord God, or Jehovah God, or actually YHWH God, comes out to 111. Many of you see 111 on your clocks, <laughs> or in different ways, 111. Thy testimonies have I taken as a heritage forever, they are, for they are the rejoicing of my heart. A heritage. A heritage of who? The Lord God. Uh, the, our heritage, our inheritance from the Lord God is revealed and given to us through faith in God's testimonies. Wow. You know, we, we inherit who Jesus is through the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. Our inheritance is given to us in this way. We make much of the fact that we're to be joint heirs with Christ. But if we're not partaking of the inheritance, how can we be joint heirs with Christ? People don't understand that God's got a means to an end. The means in order for us to receive the inheritance is through God's testimonies, through His promises, through His good news, through His gospel. And many people are not partaking of what God gave them at the cross. Our inheritance, right? Our inheritance is to be sons of the living God. And the whole creation is waiting for the manifestation of this inheritance to be manifest so that the creation itself would be delivered from the curse that's upon it. One twelve says, I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes forever, even unto the end. Yes, and also ask God to incline your heart to perform His statutes in you, right? And He says, I hate them that are of a double mind, but Thy law do I love. Yes, and of course, you know, the Lord Himself doesn't promise anything to those who are of a double mind. A double mind, actually, in James chapter 1, uh, means two-souled. He said, but if any of you lacketh wisdom, that's verse 5, let him ask of God, who giveth to all liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. So here's the double mind, faith and doubting. Faith and doubting, that's the double mind, the two-souled, right? 
Let him ask in faith, nothing doubting. For he that doubteth is like the surge of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, a double-minded man or a two-souled, literally two-souled man, unstable in all of his ways. Amen. And none of us want this in our life, and we don't see it as anything that's godly, right? You know, unbelief is a sin. And, uh, of course, we think of it more of as a weakness, but it's a sin, the sin of unbelief according to Hebrews. The evil heart of unbelief, Paul called it in Hebrews. We should hate it. We should trust in the Lord's salvation to deliver us from it, right? Ask the Lord to deliver you from uh, unbelief. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. So the Lord is our hiding place and our protection from the enemy, our shield. But then he turns around and says, I hope in thy word. Because the manifestation of the Lord to us is through his word. He teaches us to be shielded from our enemy, to be hidden by abiding in the secret place of the Most High, right? Depart from it. Don't you think we need to be protected to have a shield in the days that we're coming into now that we can see beginning to happen around us now. We need that, and, and it's God's Word that's going to give us that shield. It, it just tells you that many people are preparing for these things in the flesh, but the most important thing they're ignoring, and that is to put the Word of God in their heart, right? Depart from me, ye evil doers that I may keep the commandments of my God. Depart from me, that I may keep the commandments of my God. You know, the Bible says, Be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. That's 1 Corinthians 15 and 33. Be not deceived. Evil companionships. He says, Depart from me, evildoers, that I may keep the commandment of my God. You know, in Proverbs 13, in verse 20, we are told, Walk with wise men, and thou shalt be wise. But the companion of fools shall smart for it. it means you're going to come under judgment. If you hang out with fools, you're going to come under judgment. If you walk with wise men, you'll be wise. Don't be deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. You'll destroy yourself hanging out with foolish people, people full of the traditions of men, people who are full of the leaven of the Pharisees or the leaven of Herod, which Jesus warned us to avoid. In one sixteen, Behold, uphold me according to thy word that I may live. And let me not be ashamed of my hope. That's a good request, isn't it? Let me not be ashamed of my hope. Recently, the Lord gave me um, a word in Psalm 25, in verse 2, concerning shame and uh, concerning enemies. And he says, um, O oh my God, in thee have I trusted. Let me not be put to shame. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, none that wait for thee shall be put to shame. They shall be put to shame that deal treacherously without a cause. Amen. Let me not be put to shame. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Praise God. And we can, this is a prayer, obviously, in, in, in Psalm 119 and 116. It's a prayer that the Holy Spirit wrote for us so that we would know we can pray this prayer and receive an answer. Let me not be ashamed of my hope. Hold thou me up and I shall be safe. You know, the Bible says safety is of the Lord. We can ask the Lord to hold us up and give us protection, right? And shall have respect unto thy statutes continually. 
Well, I tell you, you can't have safety unless you have respect unto God's statutes continually. The Word is what God uses to give us safety. It's our shield, as we said in verse 114. It's our shield. It's our protection. So, you know, I remember in Isaiah chapter 10 how the Lord said about the Assyrian beast, how that he was going to use them. It wasn't in their heart. It was in their heart to plunder God's people. But, but God said he put it in their heart to do a work on his people, uh, to use them as a tool to create his people. And he said when he was through working on them, then he would punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. First, he uses the world upon us. And then, when he's through, he judges the world. But also, when the Assyrian beast came against God's people, Zion was delivered. Zion didn't go through what the rest of Israel went through. I mean, the Assyrian beast conquered the northern ten tribes and even conquered Judah, but couldn't conquer Zion. God preserved them. He said in, in verse 118, he says, Thou has set it not all them that err from thy statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. Notice this. If you want to be one of those who is protected and blessed and preserved by the Lord, notice what he says. Thou hast set it not all them that err from thy statutes. You're asking to be judged if you go astray from God's word. You're asking to be judged. God's word cannot be broken. He said he will set you at naught. He said, Thou puttest away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love thy testimonies. A person that loves God's testimonies won't be put away like the world is, won't be tribulated, won't be cursed, won't be destroyed like the world is. God has promised. Remember, it was Zion that escaped. And um, God has promised the same for us. He's promised us deliverance. Let me read this to you. Psalm 24 and verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? That's Zion. Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto falsehood, we're going through a trial here, doctrinally speaking, you know, to find the truth. The truth sets you free. It keeps you free. It protects you. Uh, it's what Zion represents is truth and purity, right? But the person who lifts up his soul unto falsehood, he permits deception for whatever reason. Most people fall into deception because they're lured by the lusts of their flesh to believe something that they think will prosper them in some kind of way, physically speaking. And that's how they get deceived. But a person who loves the truth, they're not going to be bribed by false doctrine, by false hope of gain. They're not going to be bribed. We're obviously going to be tempted and going to be tried. And we're going to be proven as to whether we love the truth or not. We love God's word or not. It says, and hath not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And also a text like that in Psalm 15, Lord, who shall sojourn in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, worketh righteousness, and speaketh truth in his heart. And on and on it speaks about not slandering your neighbor and uh, so on and so forth. So we're in a trial here to find out who it is that loves truth more than they love prosperity and peace and all these other things, you know. They're not going to be bribed. In Psalm 119 again, he says, My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the, the Bible says, fear the Lord and depart from evil, the Bible says. Let me read Proverbs chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. He says, Then will they call upon me, 
but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, they did not choose the fear of the Lord. See, somebody that chooses the fear of the Lord, chooses to find out what God desires and how He leads and what is His direction and what it is to be in right relationship with Him and in obedience to His Word. Anybody that fears the Lord is going to do those things. They're going to love the truth. They're going to seek to be obedient to God. So the fear of the Lord is a good thing. And then there's some prayers that are prayed here in Psalm 119. Some Holy Spirit-led prayers. He says, I have done justice and righteousness. Leave me not to mine oppressors. Don't leave me in the hand of the wicked or in the hand of the oppressors. And there's another um, Psalm 125 that suits both what we've already seen and what we're reading right now. Psalm 125, they that trust in the Lord are as Mount Zion. In other words, the faithful, the people who are full of faith, they're like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. In other words, no matter what happens in the world, they're not going to be moved. But abideth forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from this time forth and forevermore. So Zion, again, is the place of escape, the place of protection, the place of respect for his word. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, that is, those in Zion. And as you know, the Assyrian beast wasn't able to conquer Zion, that the righteous put not forth their hands into iniquity. Do good, O Lord, unto those that are good. So really, you know, folks, it's very plain that that the beast is going to conquer most of what we call Christianity from the types and shadows, but it's not going to conquer Zion, those that trust in the Lord. God says, do good to those that are good and to them that are upright in their hearts. But as for such as turn aside unto their crooked ways, in other words, they're bribed to turn away from God's word, to reject knowledge and truth, God will lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. He means into bondage. That's what he means. Because the Assyrians led away Israel into bondage. But not Zion. They'll lead them forth with the workers of iniquity. Mm-hmm. Back to our text in Psalm 119. Be surety for thy servant for good. Let not the proud oppress me. Mine eyes fail for thy salvation and for thy righteous word. In other words, I don't think this terminology is well understood probably in the West. Uh, mine eyes fail to see or to wait for, to see God's salvation and uh, for his righteous word, right? God's salvation is something we all need every day to be saved, to be the word soteria in the New Testament means saved, delivered, healed, all these things, all the provision of God, right? So, you know, we have to patiently wait to see the salvation of the Lord. God's word, of course, encourages us and it gives us that patience that we need to endure the trial of our faith to see the answers, right? And I tell you, if you're in a trial of your faith, read the Word of God, especially the Psalms. They will encourage you to no end, to be, be strong, to endure to the end, to, to receive your answer, right? Deal with thy servant according to thy loving kindness, and teach me thy statutes. This is grace, isn't it? Deal with me according to mercy. Teach me thy statutes. I am thy servant. Give me understanding. Solomon prayed that. He prayed for understanding. It pleased the Lord so much that he asked for understanding rather than the life of his enemies or riches that he gave him an understanding heart above anybody around him. And not only that, he gave him the riches too. 
but the fact that he asked for understanding pleased the Lord. I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. It is time for the Lord to work, for they have made void thy law. Boy, I tell you, if there's ever a time this is true is now. They are making void God's law all across the world. You know, in places where it was respected, it's being struck down. Even in this nation, we've got the most rebellious uh, leadership there's ever been, the most decrepit of all. And uh, it's time for the Lord to start working because they have made his, avoid His law. Therefore, I love thy commandments. Amen. Above gold, yea, above fine gold. Oh, if it was true of God's people that they would love His commandments above any kind of gain, it would be just awesome. I'll read Proverbs 3, 13. It says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. For the gaining of it is better than the gaining of silver, and the profit thereof than of fine gold. Amen. There is nothing in this world to be compared with God's wisdom. That's why Solomon asked the Lord, and, and it pleased him so much that he gave it to him. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts, in Psalm 119 and 128, concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. This is, this is what we need, folks. we got to presume immediately that everything God says is correct. He has the answers for all of our problems. And uh, many people, they're quick to argue with the Word of God, especially if they've got some idol, you know. Um, religions are idols. Pastors can be idols. You know, selfish ambition can be an idol. But we have to be assured in ourselves that the Word of God is correct no matter what. It is crucifying. It is bitter to the belly. But it, we have to consider it correct. People that argue with it, it's, it's amazing to me, you know, why people will argue with God's Word. And you will tell them, look, this is not my words. This is God's Word. Notice what it says. Thy testimonies are wonderful. Therefore doth my soul keep them. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. They are wonderful. They are awesome. They are God's method of bringing salvation and deliverance and provision to us. The opening of thy words giveth light. Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, he said, right? In 105. The opening of the words give light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. We're all simple, folks. We all, we all need God's understanding, His wisdom, His direction. I opened wide my mouth and panted, for I longed for Thy commandments. Yes, indeed. You know, Psalm 42 speaks about the heart panteth, as the heart panteth after the water brooks. So panteth my soul after thee. For I long for thy precepts. Jesus said, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. The Lord can put this desire in you that's so supernatural, so overwhelming. God gave me that gift when I was young in the Lord. And I wasn't a studious person either. It just didn't come natural to me. But he gave me that gift to desire strongly after his commandments. This is nothing but health and blessing to you when you have it. Turn thee unto me and have mercy upon me, as thou usest to do to those that love thy name. What is common to those that love God's name, you know, is that he turns them unto him. He has mercy on them. Establish my footsteps in thy word. Again, grace, grace. We're asking God to do something for us. Something that most people think God has made us responsible to do. 
but we're asking God to do it. Establish my footsteps in thy word. Let not any iniquity have dominion over me. That's the command of God to us. But of course, we're telling God that, Lord, we know you can do this in us by grace. So we turn back to God and we ask him to do this in us. Even as we are being obedient, we ask him to do this. Redeem me from the oppression of man. So will I observe thy precepts or keep thy precepts. Amen. Make thy face to shine upon thy servant and teach me thy statutes. In other words, have favor on me, O Lord. Have favor on me. Give me your grace. Teach me your statutes. Streams of water run down mine eyes because they observe not thy law. Amen. Oh, Father, we just ask you in the name of Jesus, Lord, let your word sink deep into our hearts. Cause us to desire more than anything to love your word, love your principles, study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Lord, we desire earnestly that you would put this desire, this gift in us, O oh Lord, to um, every day search out your word, to form good habits every day, to put you first in our day, to study you when we get up in the morning, and if, and even to cause us and give us the gift to get up early. I remember I was sharing with the class one time, folks, and I uh, I told them how I got up early at 4 o'clock in the morning to study God's Word before coming to work. And I told them, I said, God will do this for you. I said, if you don't believe that God will do this for you, you ask God to wake you up one hour early in the morning to study His Word and see what happens. You know, almost that whole class came back the next day and said, you know, I woke up, I turned and looked at the clock, and it was one hour before my clock was due to go off the alarm. And they was just all so excited because it happened to almost all of them. <laughs> God wants us to put him first and his word first, right? Glory be to God. Well, Lord, we just thank you so much, Father, for fulfilling this desire in us to have a desire for your word. And Lord, I ask you to reach out and touch people that are joining us today. If you, Father, want them to wake up early, put you first, put the word of God in their heart for the day, how many times do they put the very word that they need for that day in their heart that morning? Lord, if you really want them to do that and to put you first, I ask that you give them that sign. All those that agree with me right now, that you would give them that sign that when they woke up in the morning, it would be one hour before they normally get up. If they have normally set their alarm clock or if they normally wake up by their inner alarm clock, you know, that you would wake them up one hour early just to show them, Lord, that it is important that you meet with them in the morning through your word, that they study this word that gives us all these awesome benefits that we're seeing Psalm 119 tells us about. Lord, we ask you for this gift. And for those that are agreeing with me today, if they want this sign from you, Lord, that you would give them this sign, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, your word is safety. Safety from the enemy. It's transformation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's holiness. It's separation from this world. It's righteousness. Lord, you promised deliverance to the righteous. You promised safety to the righteous. Lord, your word is Christ in us. We ask you, Lord, to bring to remembrance everything that you have said to us in your word, Lord. Bring in, give us that supernatural recall, Lord, that only your Holy Spirit can do, Father. Lord, help us to put the word in there so that it can be recalled. But then give us that supernatural recall. 
that you promised your Holy Spirit would give us, Father. He brings to remembrance all things that you have said unto us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, um, help us to lay aside all of our idols that are distracting us from studying your word. Lord, help us to give up our hobbies that we think we're entitled to in order to study your word, which is going to be most important to us for our salvation in the days to come and for the people around us who are depending upon us to share the word of the Lord with them. Lord, let your word be valuable in our hearts, Lord. Let us hunger and thirst after righteousness, for as Jesus said, we will be filled if we do this. Give us this gift, O Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. For more information and materials, go to www.americaslastdays.com.